Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. We played D&D last week, and we're going to play tonight, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock Pacific time on Twitch. There's a link in the doobly-doo. I think the campaign is going really well, and players are having a lot of fun. And our friend Matt O'Driscoll has now permanently joined us. He makes, I think, a really engaging and fun. He's such a good role player, and he's such a good sport about everything. He's a great addition to the group. This is a campaign diary where I narrate what happened last time we played, and then I give you my perspective of how I think things went from behind the screen. Actually... Behind the screen would probably be a better name for these. I wonder if it's too late to change it. When last we left our heroes, the chain of Akron, a mercenary company, are on the cusp of recovering the crown of House Valletta. It's a, it's an, it's an important political object. It's not magical as they discovered, and it was lost in the underdark for reasons they don't really understand. A long time ago, they were hired by an undead lawyer representing his firm represents an unnamed benefactor. So the players don't actually. They think they know who they're working for, but they don't actually know who they're working for. So they. They don't know why House Valletta's crown was down here in the first place, but they know that this temple that they're in the middle of belongs to a mad old one. The old ones in my setting are Aboleths. It was a lot of fun in an earlier campaign. The players played for months, hearing, meeting people in the Underdark talking about how the old ones are behind all of the bad stuff that's happening, and they're like, what are the old ones? And they had a lot of different theories and, and, and ideas, which was a lot, of, which was neat, a lot of fun for me. And it turns out they're Aboleths. So Aboleths in my setting, because of this, and also because of my history with the game when they used to be nastier than they are now, these Aboleths are much nastier than the ones you find in the Monster Manual. Leech, Matt O'Driscoll's character, who is a drow, he, they brought him along on purpose because he's an expert on the Underdark. Leech describes them as being like demigods. So this is a mad demigod's lair, and he set a bunch of puzzles for them in an attempt to catch them and drive them mad, which is a, you know, it's a conceit. Obviously, it's not really going to drive them mad, but it might have gotten them killed. They now find themselves outside a solarium. They're inside a replica, a mental replica of a Riohan manor house, presumably House Valletta's manor house. And it is, it is illusory. It's not, it's not real. It doesn't have real substance. Parts of it are very real indeed. They're standing outside the solarium, which is like this greenhouse. It's got a natural bath in it that's got a pool, it's got glass windows, and there is a table set for tea with like a parasol to keep the sun out, and at this table is an undead figure dressed in Riohan garb and an actually dead, the corpse of a woman dressed in a, in a, in a Riohan dress, and this undead figure is serving cakes and tea and then being kind of frustrated that uh, the woman doesn't respond, and the players watch this from outside the, from outside the Solarium, and they realize that this uh, this undead figure is on a loop, that he's just repeating the same actions over and over again. The undead figure seated at the table is wearing a crown, uh, apparently the crown of House Valletta. This is the object they have come to recover. They rest for an hour because they're they're pretty badly wounded and they're lacking some of their resources, and now they have a warlock with them who benefits quite a lot from a short rest. So they take a short rest, and then they enter the solarium, and nothing happens at first. There's nothing attacks them, nothing jumps out at them, but they notice there are three mirrors positioned around the room. Slim, the Githyanki battlemaster, approaches this undead figure and looks at him and watches, and as soon as he's within the undead figure's eyesight, the undead figure starts talking to him. He says, tell me, how is it in the city outside? Do the guilds still fight over money? This is an undead Riohan noble who is talking to Slim as though Slim is one of his servants. He doesn't see Slim as being a Githyanki, just as Slim doesn't see him as being a living, breathing human duke. Slim, who is, as Phil plays him, quite explicitly an alien, a Gith Yankee who doesn't have the same reactions to all of this stuff that a human might have, Slim gives a very glib response to this undead figure who responds by saying, a servant should not talk to their master thus. Slim says, I am no servant, and says something very aggressive, causing this figure to suddenly actually turn and look at Slim for the first time and say that he's going to flay his flesh from his bones. He says, you work for the gills by Enzio's seven scars, I'll have you hung for your insolence. And it's initiative. Meanwhile, the other players have been inspecting the mirrors because they have correctly guessed that the mirrors hold the key to either getting out of this place or discovering its true nature. And for a while, the players thought this was a puzzle. This was just another puzzle. They didn't realize it was just a combat encounter. But it was sort of a puzzle. The puzzle was, are they going to figure out how to escape? Because their first thought was, we'll just jump into the pool. Jumping into the pool in the Temple of Anti-Sanity is how we got into this realm. And 
this pool has the same kind of water and the same kind of light coming out of it. That must be the exit. But then they start looking at the mirrors and they start reformulating their hypothesis. Two of the mirrors depict the solarium as they see it when they look around, but they cannot see themselves in those two mirrors. But if they look into the mirror and, and angle it so they can see the undead figure seated at the table, they don't see somebody dressed in Riohan finery wearing a, a crown. They see a withered husk wrapped in bandages wearing a crown. I changed what I thought the mirrors were going to show sort of on the fly because the players had decided this all must be an illusion. That can't be the real crown. And I was like, well, it is the real crown. How do I, how do I, how do I get them to realize that without just telling them? And that's why I changed how the mirrors work. So looking in the mirror shows you the Duke in his true form, which is a withered mummy in rags, not a person in noble Riohan finery. And that worked, by the way. The players went from thinking the crown wasn't real to realizing that the crown was real. But it was weird that they couldn't see themselves in the mirror. Well, what about that third mirror? So they look into the third mirror, and the third mirror shows nothing. Just this kind of smoky, gray realm. No floor, no walls, no ceiling. But they can see themselves quite clearly. I wasn't even really sure how exactly the players were going to come to the conclusion that that mirror was the exit. Except it's similar, I think, to how I described the mirror in one of the puzzles that they had to use to get to the next puzzle. So the, they, they managed to figure it all out, which made me very happy because that was a little dicey moment. The players were coming to all sorts of wrong conclusions and I had to guide them to the, to the right exit. That is the crown you need, just grab it and go without them going down the rabbit hole or without me having to just explicitly tell them. So I think that worked. They felt smart. They felt like they had figured something out. It's initiative. This is the boss fight of the entire Underdark adventure. And it is in fact a mummy lord that they are facing. And let me tell you, this is a legit mummy lord straight out of the monster manual. And this, I think, is a huge important lesson for all of us as dungeon masters because things did not go the way I think you might imagine they would go. First of all, let me explain that of these players, one of them is playing a custom class that I made up, the Illrigger. But Lars is playing a bog standard legal race and class combination from Wizards of the Coast products. And now, basically, so is Phil. Phil's playing a Battlemaster. Uh, the fact that he's a Gith, it, Gith is an, there's official rules for how to play a Gith. And Phil's effectiveness in combat, Slim's power, doesn't come from being a Gith, comes from being a Battlemaster. Tom is playing a tweaked version of a Ranger, but most of his stuff is just Bog standard ranger abilities. He puts Hunter's Mark on people. He shoots a bow at them. Boots, Tom's character is now playing a regular everyday bard, a College of Swords bard. Leech is playing a regular warlock. So of the party, one of them is playing a custom class, but Judge is not the most effective person in combat. Slim is. Slim is dishing out a ridiculous amount of damage every round, and they have perfectly by the book magic items. I have followed the rules using the you know, tables in Xanthar's guide, making sure that they have the uh, items that are appropriate for a sixth level party, which means like I think only one or two of them have a plus one weapon. Slim has a magic weapon, but it's not a plus one weapon. So they fight this mummy lord. It's the final encounter, and it was a lot of fun. It was a really cool encounter. I was very happy with it, but I had to bust my butt to keep this mummy lord alive. On paper, this was a beyond deadly encounter, but in reality, the play it was almost a cakewalk. The players were almost able to do 100% of this mummy's damage in one round. They attack the mummy lord. He uses his legendary actions, and again, not only did I have to give the mummy more hit points to keep him alive, although it was still within the range of the mummy's possible hit points, I also had to give him extra legendary actions so that he could use his all the abilities that he needed to stay alive and challenge the party. I didn't fudge any die rolls, but I definitely fudged stuff like hit points and how many legendary actions the mummy got because the players, I, wa I wanted the players to win, but it would have felt incredibly anticlimactic and unearned if they had just smoked this guy in one round. The mummy has a dreadful gaze, which it can use every round. And dreadful gaze, if you fail the save for that, it will shut you down. And if you fail it by more than five, it's even worse, which I quite like. I, I wish there were more abilities that uh, were effective in proportion with how well or how badly you saved against them. I realize that would be more bookkeeping, which for some people would be more tedious, but I think on a on a monster by monster basis, it would be a nice option to have. He punches Slim and does like 9d6 damage from a punch, and there's a chance you can get mummy rot. Nobody got mummy rot. Unfortunately, I think it would have been kind of neat. And he can use his dreadful gaze. And this is where we discover that the action economy is so much more important to encounter design than CR. This mummy can do a ridiculous amount of damage with a punch, 
but it can only punch once per round. And its dreadful gaze can shut somebody down, but it's only for one round. There isn't really a way for him to chain uh, dreadful gazes together. Unless he uses his legendary action, he can only lock down one character per round, which is, thank God, that's, otherwise this could very easily turn into a catastrophe. The mummy has taken a lot of damage, so it uses one of its legendary actions to turn into a whirlwind, which is an ability that lets it move 60 feet. It's able to cross the entire solarium, which is a, a large pool, like a, like a natural bath. And that was one of the most critical things in the encounter was, one, the size and shape of the room. It was so big, the players could not easily get from one side to the other. And because of his legendary action, the mummy lord could. That radically changed the nature of the the battle and affected everything that came afterwards, including, I think, the tense, one of the most tense and cool moments that's happened in the game so far, because at that point, the ticking clock started to become relevant, and I drew this huge shadow in the pool, and I talked about how the light starts to dim as the glow from the pool is blotted out by some massive creature in the water below, and... Oh, Matt O'Driscoll playing Leech immediately goes, the old one. They can see it rising. They have a certain number of rounds that they don't know exactly how many before it will become an, an element of this combat. So they've got to get the crown and get the heck out of there. Two of the players spend the next round just trying to get across the room, just trying to cover the space. They can't fly. They can't jump over the pool. It's too wide, so they have to run around. And meanwhile, Leech has the idea of using his imp, Odie, to grab the crown and just get out of there, which I knew was always a possibility. Slim fails to save against the mummy's dreadful gaze, which means he's going to spend a round literally doing nothing. He's stunned, which is huge for this combat because Slim's output is so ridiculous. Boots tries to grab the crown, but the mummy grabs Boots instead and throws Boots into the pool with the old one. And the old one tries to, I show Boots a picture of the Aboleth, Tom Schmuck. I don't think he'd ever seen an Aboleth before. And he was like, oh, what is that? And I I had him make a saving throw. He made his saving throw, and I described this oppressive pressing down sense as he's in the water, not like he's drowning, but like he's going to lose his mind, but he manages to shake it off, and he gets out of the water, and he is like, we have got to get out of here. He is immediately ready to run to the mirror and quit this place. Meanwhile, Odie grabs the crown off the Duke as Slim finally recovers from the dreadful gaze, spends an entire round running across the pool, and kills the Mummy Lord. The players now have to get to the mirror to get out before the old one surfaces. That's not a problem for most of them, but Slim and Judge have to use their entire movement just to get to the mirror, and they are now standing literally next to it, five feet away from the mirror, which was an incredibly dramatic point, because at that moment, the old one starts to crest the water, and mind controls Judge. Judge turns to Slim, his eyes change, and he says in the old one's voice, you will make a welcome addition to my menagerie. And Phil is like, now what? Do I have to kill Judge before we can get out of here? And then Boots barrels into Judge, knocking Judge into the mirror. It was such a perfect, dramatic moment. Boots escapes, Slim escapes, King escapes, and they all start climbing out of the pool of water. It's like a large bathtub, the altar in the Temple of Anti-Sanity. The way they got in here in the first place, they climb out, they see, oh, we remember this place. Look, here's all the dead Darrow that we left here. And they run through the entire Isle of Madness. They get to the Somnium Tenebris, they fire it up, punch it slim, and they translate themselves back to the mundane world, and they smell the salt air, and they hear the gulls, and they realize that they are near capital, the place they left. That was incredible. That was so awesome. It was so much fun for me. I definitely had a moment where I was like, what happens if the old one mind controls somebody who's nowhere near the mirror? Now what's going to happen? Because unlike the mummy lord, who can really only dreadful gaze one person at a time, the old one could mind control the entire part. Party, there's nothing they'll be able to do about it. And it's one thing to be like, well, I can push you into a mirror. It's another thing. Am I going to, am I going to knock this character out and then pick them up? Does that mean we have to have an entire combat where I have to try to knock out judge? And then once judge goes unconscious, throw him on my shoulder and leave. This is, this could very easily turn into one of those, you know, catastrophe waves where there's a tipping point and everything goes south. But miraculously, the two nastiest fighters in the group both ended up, both ended their turns standing right next to the mirror, and at that
that point, I knew it was going to work and the players would figure out I wouldn't have to explain anything. I wouldn't have to give them any hints. They would know if one of them failed their save and got mind control, they could push that character into the mirror. That is exactly what happened. There is There are very few things as satisfying as when the DM sets something up but doesn't explain it. And the players just instantly figure it out because they've seen movies and other cultural references and they just go with it and everything works. It was incredibly satisfying job, job well done folks. This is the first real job the chain of Akron have completed. So they go back to the Pharaoh's dream. I described the process of how they don't have to go through customs anymore. They have their papers. They can just show them and get into the city. King decides, listen, this is our first job completed. He lets the concierge at the Pharaoh's dream know that they want to speak tomorrow morning with uh, Reginald Orfeo, the lawyer from the firm that hired them. Meanwhile, King is going to take the senior officers and they're going to go to the footstool, which is the tavern that all the other rank and file members of the chain of Akron are staying at and they're going to celebrate. He's going to use the treasury and he's going to buy everybody drinks and food and it's a huge party. That was awesome. I love the fact that Lars took the initiative with that and said, we're going to celebrate. You know, this is what the chain does after they complete a job. And even though these guys didn't go on that job, everybody benefits from our victory. And there was some discussion about the fact that they wanted to talk about the job, but there are other people staying at this tavern, right? It's a, it's a popular kind of middle-class tavern and they had to wait for their revelries to kind of drive out all of the people that were just there for a meal and are just, they're going to go up to the rooms and sleep or leave. The one thing the players noticed, though, was that Angel wasn't anywhere to be found, and that caused some consternation, and both Judge and King went to Two Shoes and said, Two Shoes, where's Angel? And Two Shoes is like, I told him that you guys wanted to have a meeting here at this time, but he hasn't shown up. And so the players start to think that maybe there's something wrong with Angel, but Two Shoes is like, I saw him a couple days ago. He said he was going to go gather some information, and they're like, okay, well, let's just wait and see what happens to Angel. The party at the end is a blast. Boot writes a song about the underdark job. Slim demands that there is a stanza in there about his actions and Boots is happy to accommodate him. So everybody's happy. And King uses this opportunity to make uh, Slim an actual official member of the group. He swears the oath. There is no formal oath of the chain. There have been several different oaths in the Chronicle written down. And it basically boils down to, do you swear to follow the hierarchy of the chain? Do you swear that you leave your previous life behind, which is probably the more important part? And do you agree to complete the contract no matter the cost. Slim says that all sounds good to him. So now Slim is an official senior officer of the chain of Akron. He also gets uh, King awards him and he had kind of used this as uh, a carrot. He showed Phil, who's now playing a, a Get the Yankee, who's psionic, that they had recovered a psionic crystal, which is a magic item from strongholds and followers. It's uh, a piece of a gemstone dragon that confers psionic abilities on whoever uses it. And Slim, Phil, looks at some of these abilities like, holy crap, I want this thing. And Lars is like, well, then you got to take the oath if you want that, because this is uh, this is the treasure property of the chain of Akron. And Slim's like, well, I'm with you guys then. And that was a really cool moment. Boots decides that he's going to stay here with the rank and file while they go back to the Pharaoh's dream. He's going to spend the night here in the footstool. And that was a campaign changing decision. And I'll tell you why in a second. The characters all go back to the Pharaoh's dream, but I stay with Boots. And I say, so yeah, you're gonna spend the night here, no problem. People start going back to the room. Some people are passed out in the common room. You get a room to yourself. How do you how do you sleep? Do you sleep like clothed? Do you sleep, you don't sleep in your armor. And Tom thought about it and goes, I, I probably sleep in the buff. I'm a Riohan and it's the middle ages. Yeah, why not? And I said, okay, fine. I'm not sure if I had Tom make a check or not, but Tom is awoken near dawn the next day by three shadowy figures approaching his bed in the in, out of the darkness. They are literally shadows and Boots has to defend himself. His weapon is nearby, his armor is nearby, but Boots is a bard now and Boots casts hypnotic pattern. As far as I could tell, there's no, the, the shadows have no immunity to these types of spells. So they all fail. All three of the shadows fail their saving throws and the shadows are mesmerized by this hypnotic pattern that Boots put on the ceiling. Boots grabs his weapon, his clothes, his armor. He runs outside. He discovers that the entire tavern is under attack. There are other members of the chain of Acheron spilling out into the corridor, fighting shadows and Boots joins the fight. And between Boots and Two Shoes, they are able to kill all the other shadows. But one of the shadows reaches out to 
one of the members of the chain of Akron, one of the rank and file soldiers who I think of as being either a zero level or a first level fighter and drains his strength, create killing that character, killing them and creating another shadow to fight. Shadows are CR one half though. So this battle is incredibly straightforward. It was easy to run and it, I, happily, the other players never seemed to get upset that they were, they didn't get any action. They were riveted by what was happening. Boots and Two Shoes and the other surviving members of the chain of Akron go back down to the common room. The stone giant that owns this inn is a stone giant with a dwarf buddy who does all the cleaning up around here. The stone giant who runs the inn is furious because he doesn't know, he's angry mostly because he has no idea what happened and a bunch of his guests just died, including many of the people who were just staying here, had nothing to do with the chain of Akron. They just wanted a nice, safe place to get a meal and sleep. They're dead, they were turned into shadows, and the only evidence that anything else has happened is a broken window and an iron bar that's sitting on the ground. Boots picks up the iron bar and he's like, is it magical? Apparently not. Humans in my setting can sense magic natively. They can't tell where it's coming from, but they know when there's magic within about 30 feet. The stone giant has his dwarf go get the cops and he he says, none of you are leaving this place because he doesn't know what's happened. He's looking for somebody to blame really and kind of wants to blame the chain of Akron. Boots is like, we didn't have anything to do with this. Let me go get, let me go report in to my commanding officers. And the stone giant is like, no. Boots tries to convince him the stone giant is not having it. Boots did not, Tom did not roll well enough. And this stone giant puts himself between Boots and the door and Boots is like, all right, we'll stay here and we'll wait for the cops and then I cut to the Pharaoh's dream. The players wake up and they have their breakfast. They want to run back to the uh, to the footstool and they're like, hey, what happened to Boots? And they want to use Boots' absence as an alarm. But I said to King, I said, in your experience, I, you know, Boots is a, was a junior officer until very recently. Was he the kind of person that could be counted on to always be there in the morning? Or was he sometimes out partying? And, and Lars and Anna had to admit that probably this was in character for Boots. And so they go downstairs and they have their meeting in one of uh, the called the Hanging Gardens, which is one of the restaurants inside the Pharaoh's Dream. They have their breakfast with Reginald Orfeo and they're like, Where's the, this is a, he's a, he's a dead lawyer. He's a revenant lawyer. And they're like, Hey, where's the giant chest of money? We brought the crown. And he says, let's see it. And they, they, they produce the crown. He inspects it. Uh, they're kind of reticent to give it to him. They're, they want to do like a, like a trade, like a handoff, but he is like, look, I'm a lawyer that we're not, this isn't a hostage situation. We're not barbarians. Let me see the crown shows him the crown goes, okay. And then he pulls a, a what looks like a sheaf of notes, a bound sheaf of notes from his jacket pocket. And Anna's like, like, is he going to write us a check? Yes, he is. He writes them a check for 20,000 gold, tells them to take it to the bank and get it exchanged for notes, which is absolutely going to happen. And while they're having this discussion, he gives them a coupon. Basically, it's his card is what it is. Gives them his card, which is a blank bone white piece of paper. And he writes an address on it. He says, if you are at this address in two days, you will have access to our curator. A curator is like a place, a person you can go to and buy magic items from. This is a classic conundrum in D&D is if there are people who can make magic items, could you go to a magic shop? Could you just go to a store and buy magic items? For some people, that seems like a reasonable conclusion based on the available spells and rules of D&D. But then for other people, that would really cheapen the, the idea that magic is special and unique and having magic shops in a big city, it seems really silly. Well, my solution for that is, Yes, there are magic shops in the city, but they are all private clubs and you have to know the right people to get into it and they're highly regulated. And this is the player's, op the character's opportunity to get access to one of these once, or at least for now. They've delivered the crown, they've gotten their check, they've gotten a pass to go see a curator where they'll be able to buy or, or procure magic items and other things besides just magic items like ingredients or lore or knowledge. And then they're talking about uh, something that happened, they're talking about the other job that they didn't take. They're talking about the job at the Citadel. And the undead lawyer is like, the Citadel? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, I don't think that job's available anymore. And they're like, why not? And he's like, haven't you read the broadsheets this morning? And the player's are like, no. And so the Reginald Orfeo has a broadsheet brought over and they read this headline about how the Citadel, one of the jobs that they could have taken, that Citadel's job was done by another mercenary group who were interviewed in the broadsheet talking about what happened at this Citadel and why they did this and whether they were working for anybody. And then Judge, reading the broadsheet, looks down and there's another article in this broadsheet that was just printed like an hour ago and it talks about the incident at the footstool and how there are 36 dead. And Judge stands up and says, We've got to get back to the footstool. And 
that's where we left things. That was the game. It was a blast. I had a lot of fun. I had written up like a six page document called Angel's Report that I think I'm basically just going to read to the players in character as Angel. Hopefully it won't be boring and sound like I'm just monologuing because I'm going to try and do it in such a way that the players can interject and ask questions. But that was how I thought we were going to end things. I had no idea that Tom was going to go stay in the footstool. What the players don't know is that I had three, basically three different plot lines worked out depending on which of the different inns they chose to stay at. Do you want to stay at the expensive inn, the kind of middle class inn, or the really, really cheap inn? And I told them that each one of these is going to have an impact on not only what kind of people come to offer you jobs and what jobs are available to the chain of Akron, but also how does the city react to you? If you're staying at the Pharaoh's Dream, everyone is going to know what you're doing all the time because it's a huge, big, popular place where people go to be seen on purpose. People go stay at the Pharaoh's Dream because they want people to see how much money they have and how important they are. Whereas some of these places you could go stay at, no one would even know you guys were in town and you'd be able to get away with murder and it would never even make it into the papers. Well, they chose, they didn't, they, they, they kind of rushed to judgment and decided to stay at the most expensive place in town. So that's fine. But one of the subplots was this, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to spoil it, but this attack on this tavern was originally designed for them staying in the tavern. So when Boots decided I'm going to stay here overnight, I was like, oh, I can bust out this whole other plot line. And it was the first time in the game I was so happy. Happy. You have no idea. I was so happy. Uh, it was the first time in the game I really felt like we were starting to get that open world feel. Remember, a sandbox is I just put challenges in front of you. It's up to you how to solve them. I don't know what the answers is. It's up to you to use any tools you want. That's the sandbox style of play. It's not all about here is this lock. There is one key. Go find it. Congratulations. Now you can move on to the next level. No, I'm just going to put a challenge in front of you and it's up to you to figure out what resources are we going to use. So the game has been very sandboxy up until now. I had no idea that they were going to, I should have known, but I had no idea they were going to take over the Somnian Tenebris. That is really cool. And that has unlocked other stuff that they've been able to do like the Underdark job. They would not have been able to do otherwise. But this was the first moment where they had that open world. I can go anywhere I want and do whatever. I'm not going to go back to the Pharaoh's dream. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to hang out with the rank and file guys. And I was like, holy crap, the players are starting to use the city. If they had a map of the city, I think they would do this a lot more. So it's on me. That's on me. And this is the problem with designing a fantasy city from scratch is I'm not a cartographer. I'm not an artist. I only have this like abstract High, very high level, low detail map. So yeah, I was just ridiculously happy that the players were starting to not just wait for me to tell them what to do or wait for me to tell them what the next thing was. They were taking the initiative. King Lars, as the commander, has done this a couple times now where he has just taken the initiative. He has not waited for me to say what happens next. He's like, we are doing this. I am going to go to the footstool and we are going to throw a party. Awesome. That made me super happy with the players starting to be active instead of reactive. And then Boots saying, I'm staying here. Again, is him being active instead of reactive and it unlocked a whole other plot thread that I am super excited to see where it goes. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to be it's going to be game changing. I think the funny thing was that broadsheet talking about the attack that was going to happen no matter what. I, they were just going to be reading about this other plot thread that was not going to be re directly relevant to them. But because of Boots, it suddenly became relevant. I did not know that the other members of the chain of Akron were staying at this hotel that I was planning on attacking with shadows. These were two completely different data points that I had not put together. So when Lars said, we're going to go here because that's where all of the non-senior officers are staying, I went, oh, that's interesting. That's where that one attack was going to happen. But now I feel like it wouldn't be fair to kill off some of the rank and file members of the chain of Akron to a bunch of shadows without the players being able to do something about it. That would feel like I was taking away player agency from them and I was punishing them for things they hadn't done. But as soon as Boots said, I'm staying here, I'm like, Meat is back on the menu, boys. Now I can definitely deploy this subplot and attack the party because it won't be them reading about this thing that happened in the paper and their characters getting killed. I was like, no, that's not cool. Let's have them read about a a inn, a hotel, uh, a tavern that had been attacked by shadows, but not the one that they were staying at. So yeah, huge, huge lesson. Great, great session. Uh, lessons from the session are definitely that like CR is not with the money lord. CR is nowhere as important as the action economy. That 
Mummy Lord should have been able to wipe the floor with them. And it's not like I've overloaded them with magic items. Quite the opposite. They were they would have smoked that mummy if I hadn't been working my butt off to keep it alive. And then the other element is that when the players start trying to, when they start taking over their characters, when they start doing, like going off the rails and not waiting for me to tell them what happens next, they just have stuff they want to do. It's just delightful. It's, it's really one of those milestone moments in the campaign where it starts to feel like the world is coming alive. If you are following this stuff in just a couple of hours, tonight at seven o'clock, we are going to continue and we're going to find out what happened. They're going to meet the cops and the reporters who are going to come to the inn and there's going to be a whole conflict there. And then they're going to get Angel's report. And for the first time, the players are going to be exposed to what everybody who followed the world building uh, sessions we did on Twitch already knows. And I believe those videos are going to be on the second channel. You'll be able to watch the entire series of them from beginning to end. I don't know. They may be available now, unsure, but we'll start making them available ASAP. Thanks for watching, folks. I hope you get a kick out of this stuff. I love doing these campaign diaries and I am just deeply in love with the way the chain of Akron is going. I hope I can, as a dungeon master, live up to the promise in these early sessions. We'll see. It's still, it, it's always possible that things could go south and fall apart. And sometimes it falls apart in ways that are easy to fix and temporary. Sometimes things fall apart in ways that are permanent and you don't have control over that always. I'd like to do, I did a post-mortem for the whole intro, everything getting up to capital, but I had stopped doing the campaign diaries and so I never uploaded it. So I should probably go back and watch it and see if it's it's still watchable and still useful. I would definitely like to do a campaign diary for like a post-mortem on just this adventure, the Underdark job and what went well and what went wrong. But I don't know if I have time and I don't know how useful it would be. I think I would end up just recapitulating everything that happened in the other campaign diaries. But it might be useful to just have, you know, shorter, like, okay, here's act one of the Chain of Akron, a 20 minute video that you watch and you get all the juice from the first eight episodes. And then here's another video that's 20 minutes long and gets you the Underdark job, which would make it easier for people to catch up with the chain. Maybe, I don't know. Let me know what you think. So hopefully we'll see you tonight uh, for the live. And by the way, all of our videos, all the Chain of Akron stuff is on Twitch forever. And it's on the second channel archived on YouTube in 4K, which is a lot of fun to watch. I think the layout is really cool. Everything looks really cool in 4K. Thanks for watching. See you folks tonight. Until next time, peace out.